Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome back to today's Daf. Chulin Daf Kuf Lamed Gimel. We are seven lines off the top and back to the Matonis, right? The Zroya, the forearm, L'chayayim, lower jaw with the tongue and the keva, one of the uh, animal's stomachs, which are given to a Kayan. So in one shechts, his own private animal. He gifts these three sections to a coin. Now, as we learned yesterday, we're meant to be somewhat selective in terms of choosing our recipient. It should be a coin who appreciates it, who's committed to the cause, to the avoid of the kahuna. Here comes another stipulation. Amarab Abba, Amarab Hunamarab. Chutin Shabalechi Asurim. You're meant to know that the. Uh, String the, the you know the arteries, these veins within the lechi area are filled with blood, laden with blood, and may not be consumed. And therefore, before you give it to a kain, make sure that he appreciates it, that he knows how to remove it. If a kain is not proficient in how to extract these uh, problematic elements, you don't give him matan. That's not a concern, says the Gemara. Look. The blood, in any case, gets uh, sucked out, gets uh, dissolved. Ibatabi, if he's going to roast it, made up divi, the blood just trickles out. If he's going to cook it, ideally he meant to roast it, as we learned yesterday in gourmet style, but if he actually ends up cooking it, okay, if he cuts it up and he salts it, made up divi, in any way it's going to dissolve and you know the blood will just trickle out. So it is not ex- especially concerning. He'll just treat it like you know the other meats, Ensure that the blood is out. You don't have to execute a, a, a special, you know, nikor, a special extraction process. Just a regular roasting slash, you know, salting system. Omar Rava says, Rava, badaklan Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef presented us with a challenge question. I have a question for you. Hai kahana the chativ matanto. So the. Uh, Animal owner shechted the uh, the animal decided to send his matanais with uh, with a kid over to the kayan. En route, comes along another kayan and snatches it. Haikana the chotef he snatches the matanta. So although really, it, it's up to the owner's you know discretion to choose his recipient. But the chasam sefer explains: Look, he gave it up. He gave it to the kid who can't really guard his item, so it's like Aveda Midas, it's like a willful neglect. So, halakhically, the coin could just snatch it. After all, he's a coin and entitled, right? The question is, is this something commendable or not? Chabuvi kamachabiv mitzvah? Is it a chibuv, an expression of dearness? Look, he, like, uh, he likes matonis, he mitzvah so much that he grabs. Or is it perhaps just the opposite? It's degrading. To go snatch it and treat it with disrespect. So that's the question. Positive or negative? Says Rabbi, I responded to Rabbi Yasef. I resolved it based on a pasik. Venasan, right? You give it to the coin. Venasan, you give it. He doesn't grab it. He's not meant to come and take it. I'm Rabbi. Rabbi himself was a coin, a descendant of Elia coin. He says, let me give you a little perspective. Way back when, in the day, Meresh have a chatif na matanta. I would actually, actually snatch the matanis. I figured it was a show of endearness, of excitement for the mitzvah. Mina chabubi kama chabib na mitzvah. Showing chaviv for the mitzvah. And then, once I learned this uh, drasha from the pasuk, which discourages this uh, practice. Given the shaman Allah, I heard the drasha of a nasan means let him give it to you. Don't grab it. V'lo yishi told me atzmoy. The coin is not meant to take it on his own, so I stopped that practice. Mikhtav I no longer snatched it, but I would still gently uh, suggest that he give it to me. May my Amri, I would tell them, you know, humbly, please give it to me. And this would be an expression of endearment for the mitzvah, but later on I stopped that practice as well. Why? But given the Shaman Lodestani, I heard the Brisa regarding the sons of Shmuel, who was a lady. So by Shmuel Nabi's uh, children, it says, they were straight after uh, they were 
swayed by money, which almost sounds like they would steal money, but Rabbi Meir it doesn't mean literally they would take somebody else's money. Rather, B'nai, the, the sons of Shmuel, who were Levim, they merely asked for their portions, and that, even that is not appropriate. Chalkam Shalom they verbally asked. So once I got wind of this, not being uh, ideal, I stopped that as well. Meimar nami I mean, I wouldn't even say it, but I would accept. Vio if they offer it to me, Shakil, I would take it. But then even that I stopped. Kivan the Shaman Allah Dasani, once I heard the Brysa that discusses after Shimon HaTzadik passed away, there was no longer a brach and the Lacham HaPanim, it wouldn't satiate the Kihanim, so the pious ones would just pull back. Hatznuim, the Tznuim, Moishchen Asidim, they'll pull back, they wouldn't take. They would leave it for the others. Vagar Guranim, the gluttonous ones, Chalkim, they would uh, allocate portions, they would take, you know, their Chalak. So once I heard this, Mishkal, Namil Shakilna, I would stop taking. Tesis explains because, you know, I would leave it for the uh, Kehana who need it. Who can use it better than I? I'm, you know, financially okay. I didn't need it as bad. So there's no point in me, you know, going in there and leaving, let, let it for the, uh, leave it for the others. Except for once a year. Levar mi maliyam kipuri. Once a year, Ervim Kippur, I would step in there and I would take matonis. Why? So that uh, people are mindful that I'm a coin, otherwise it's going to be forgotten. To establish myself as a coin. So that's why at least once a year I would make sure to take my uh, deserving you know, uh, portion. This way, um, it is known that in fact I'm a coin. Ask the Gemara, why do you have to resort to that? What happened to other expressions of Kahuna? What about Nesias uh, Kapayim uh, in Shul? Belifros Yadeh. That would also be an expression of kahuna. Says the Gemara, Anse le idne, his, uh, his time, his seder, his shear would interfere, he wouldn't make it to the shul in time for the, you know, for the, uh, you know, for the berchas for the, for the, for the, for the minion, so uh, he wouldn't be able to do it, and rather he, um, he would ensure at least once a year he would take the matonis to confirm himself as a kohen. Amar of Yosef. Here's an interesting arrangement, stock arrangement that a kohen, that only a kohen can do. So we have high kahana, this kohen, the isle tsurba mirabon. He has this young Tamil chacham as a neighbor, bishur vuse in his neighborhood. But chikli milsa, having a hard time financially, and this kohen wants to um, help him out. So what should he do? Liske le matanta, a very convenient and effective way of um, lifting him out of his uh, financial straits. Liskele matanta. He should be mezake to him, to the Tamil Chacham, who is not a coin. He should grant him the matonis, meaning the Zroya, the Chayim Bekeva, which are directed to this coin. He should uh, steer it over to the Tamil Chacham and have him take it. You realize that in contrast to Truma, which is off limits to a Yisrael, matonis are different. Although they're meant to be given to a coin, but in terms of the actual material, there's no holiness there. So technically, once the kind gets it, he can forward it over to anybody, to this uh, poor, uh, you know, deserving Talmud Chach. But the, uh, the novelty here is that it never got to the kind. It went directly from the butcher to the uh, recipient. It never got to the hands of the kind. It was never delivered to the kind. It can still work. But Makare Kuna Levi was speaking about a kind of Levi. In this case, the point is the uh, the kayan. It's an expression, makari kuna levia. So in this case, the kayan is makari, meaning he's known and beloved, and he's uh, very well liked by the people in town who were intending on giving him the uh, matanis. In which case, the Mepharshim explained, he can be zaycha even though he didn't take physical possession, because really, the matanis are meant to go to the, you know, to the Sheva, to the Kayhanim. It belongs to them, right? And if all the other Kayhanim sort of relinquish their rights, because they know in any way, in any case, the butcher's going to give it to this Kayin, so they sort of took their minds off it. So now by default, it reverts to this Kayin, so it's like it's his. And once he owns it, he can direct it anyway, he can direct it to the Talmud Chacham. It's an interesting halacha, you can... 
the Kayin can actually give away the Matanis before he even gets it. In fact, we have a story on this, uh, in this regard. Rava, Rav Safra, they both came to this place. Iklu Levei, they came to the house of Mar Yechna Brei, the son of Rav Chanabar Adav. I'm going to say it was Levei Mar Yechna, the son of Brei, the Rav Chanabar Bizna. And for his esteemed guests, he prepared a lavish meal, Avalu Igla, a calf, Tulsa third, third born calf, a very uh, special uh, offering. And Rava had an interest in, in sampling the tongue. The tongue is part of the Lechayim, goes to the Kayin. Sure enough, the local uh, butler, the, uh, the uh, assistant there was a Kayin. Amli Dorva Lisham, he said, Rava turned to the uh, assistant over there who was a Kayin. So he was a fellow who typically would get the matanas from the uh, from his uh, owner, from his uh, boss. He says, "You know what? This time, let us have it, please." Zaki le matan to be mezakdas. Allow us to take the matanas. The beinu lemeicha. I would like to con- have a sampling of the lishna b'chardla. Some. I'd like to eat some uh, tongue with uh, dressing with mustard. Zaki le. So he went along with it. He gave it to them. So he gave it to them before he even took possession, right? As per the previous Gemara. What happened? Rava, in fact, proceeded, Achal he ate. But Rav Safra held back, Lo he didn't eat. So what happened that night? Akriyul Rav Safra, Bechelma. Rav Safra, in his dream, had this uh, vision that he was being read, he was being dictated a Pasuk and Mishle, which reads as follows, Ma'ada, Mada beget, a worn out garment beyond kara on a cold day is very you know, ineffective. Another example of something ineffective and futile is Khaimat al Nasr, you pour vinegar on this on this earth and it doesn't turn into clay, it just you know dissolves. A third example of uh, futile efforts are Vishar Bashiram. Shira means the Torah, so he sings, he expresses uh, holy words of Torah. To an unappreciative person, a lay vera, a person with a bad heart, not interested, not an understanding person, a waste of time. That's the message that he got in this dream. And he's trying to decipher it. What was the, uh, what's the lesson? Asal kamei Rav Yosef. So Rav Safra approaches Rav Yosef, who actually was the one who a minute ago told us the halacha, that a kain can redirect the matones to a worthy recipient. So he suggested to Rav Yosef that maybe that's why he was being uh, criticized in his dream because he wasn't following Rav Yosef's uh, opinion that this, you know, that this is allowed. You know, why did Rav Safra hold back? He wasn't uh, accepting of this opinion. Amrli says Dilma Mishum Da'avri, maybe because I transgressed, I failed to, uh, you know, accept Ashmata the Halacha the Mar your uh, your Halacha Kriyin Hocha. That's why I was dictated this pasuk as a form of criticism. Amrli, so Rav Yosef says. No, no, no. There's a big difference between my halacha and this case. Totally different circumstance. I spoke about a kain who, by his own you know, volition, goes ahead and offers this to the... Here, he was sort of being forced into it. It's like sort of a ma- manipulation. I never meant that, that type of case. I never allowed this type of case. When I spoke, it was ba'acher. A kain who's an independent person unbeholden to the Talmud Chacham, out of his own free will, or his own goodness of his heart. But Shama, you're a servant here. He's an employee, and he's beholden to the Baal Karchim Mizaki. He did it against his will. Furthermore, another distinction, Vaki Amri Anna, also when I spoke about doing that, Lamad Ali a fellow who's stuck in, you know, financial crisis, okay, so you help him out, you know, an occasional, you know, diversion of the Matonis, but ideally, it's meant to go to the Kayan. Oh, F. Shalei, but in our case, you don't need this. You could have had other food to eat, so that's not allowable. Okay, so if Safra wants to know, so why was I criticized? Why was I given this uh, drasha, this musr shmuz? Well, in my time, I cried, why did they relate to me this uh, pasa, klape rava? Actually, says Rav Yasef, was, was meant for rava to criticize him for what he did. No, well, the cry in the rava, so why didn't they dictate it to rava? If it's meant for him, it should go to him. Says the Gemara, Rava Nozov Hava. Rava was in the status of Nozov. He, he was distanced from Shemaim. He wasn't getting direct messages. So it had to be done in an indirect way. Someone first and bring the Gemara in Tainus, where the whole story with the king there and the um, Rava Davin that the, it should rain in the middle of the summer and the Malachi Chavala were very upset that he initiated such a miracle and uh, 
he wanted to kill him and he was saved and because of that story he became a Nozov and he wasn't getting direct messages in any case the point was just the opposite that actually this was not a commendable arrangement Amalei Abayler of Dimi okay we speak about the elaboration of this Pasuk but what's the simple meaning of this Pasuk what's the simple message of this Pasuk don't involve yourself in futile activities Amalei he says the Pasuk is advising against teaching Torah to a Talmud who is not deserving because of his uh, negative uh, character and, 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 uh, and practices a person teaches a Talmud who is not fit for it that's the fire of Gehenim for what? Yera Sarit Sarit is a Talmud Chacham who is Ra was undeserving for the uh, to get the Torah Bahala. If ain't sorry the Tamat Khacham, sorry the Tamatchum Shinamar, Vasrid Mashem Hashem Kare. And this is a, a sorry who is not deserving. So uh, that's the result. Furthermore, Omar Bzaira, Omar Ravkal Ashoinal Tamashani Hogan, a person conveys Torah to a student who's not uh, fitting. Kizurik Evan Lamakulas. It's like tossing a stone at the pile of stones you have a desire you're just adding a stone and enhancing expanding that of a desire likewise a person pours valuable material tera, into an undeserving uh, vessel he's just filling uh, and enhancing something inappropriate Shinemar as the Pasuk says Kitzruer like tossing the stone right Evan Bar Gema Kainesin looks still covered likewise a person gives covered What's covered? Ben covered al Teira. Covered refers to Teira Shnemar. Covered Chacham in Cholu Usmim in Cholu Toiv. He gives cover to Tuxil, fool, undeserving person. Amar Chacham Rachanina Kol Eisa Teivul Misheni Yoyda. Furthermore, on another note, a person puts in an effort and grants goodwill and Teiva to one who doesn't really have any appreciation for it. So it's a waste of time. Kilo Zarek Evel Markulis. Once again, it's like tossing the stone at the Markulis. Shenemar Kitzur Evan Uksiv Loy Novel Uksil Tanuk. Doing Tanuk, something you know, generous to Uksil who's not really gonna make good use of it. It's pointless. Okay, back to the halacha and the mission. So Yisrael uh, Shechts of Eima separates the Yisroya Lachayim Bekeva. Right, the Matanis sends it to the local kain. But if there's a partnership. So if the animal is partly owned by a kain who's exempt, right? That exempts the entire partnership. Likewise, if it's a, a guy who's also exempt, if he partners with a yid, the animal is potter. But the mission says to avoid any misconception, you're meant to tag the animal to indicate that in fact it's a partnership, and that that's why you're not giving them autonomous. Less people think that you're just, you know, uh, siphoning siphoning it off. When you have to tag it. Says the Gemara, so this tagging requirement is even when partner, partnering with a guy, for Aminu have a kash from a price where it says that with a guy, don't worry about tagging it. If you uh, partner with a kayin, and that is the reason for your exemption, you have to tag it and publicize it. But, if you partner with a guy, that's your reason for exemption. Another example for, of uh, an exemption which need not be tagged. Upsula Magdashim. Suppose this animal was a blemished carbon. It had Kedusha, then it got blemished, and it was sold, right? So that's also exempt from Atonis, as we had back in the Mishnah of Kuflamid. In both these cases, with the guy and the Upsula Magdash, ain't Sarah Lirshim's only to tag it. Unlike our Mishnah, which tells us that even with a guy, you have to tag it. How do we resolve this contradiction? Return to my base. Well, Hachamai Skina. This last price, which does not require tagging with a guy, is speaking to Yosef Oivit Kicham Amaschat. There's a strong indication that the guy is a partner. He's sitting there in the butcher's store, making it evident that he's a partner. As opposed to the Mishnah, which is speaking that he wasn't sitting there. So it's not public after tag. Okay, the guy was a So in this recent price, so we had three examples. By the guy, by the psuli, hamigdashim, forget about tagging. But if the kain is a partner, you have to tag it. Now we're assuming it's a similar circumstance. So if he's sitting by the butcher store, so is the kain. 
So if his presence in the butcher store indicates partnership, so why, by the Kayin, does he have to tag it? Right? Why is it different? The Kavasa, correspondingly, Gabi Kayin. In the first case where the Kayin is a partner, we're assuming the Yasa Amashat, he's also sitting at the butcher store. It's evident that he's a partner, why do you have to tag it? Well, people might not uh, draw the right conclusion. They'll say, well, he came as a, as a customer. Who says he's a partner? The Amri Brisa Kozavan. People will say he's coming to buy meat. Well, then by the guy as well. Maybe he's buying kosher meat today. Yuck, if that's the case, if that's the concern, there as well. Even if he's a partner and he's here, Amri, they'll say, okay, he's standing in line to buy meat. Brisa Kozavan. Ella, oh. Hacha, but my skin must be speaking to Yosef. Oibikicham akaspat. Must be that the guy, the partner, is sitting at the cash register, which indicates that he's a partner. Okay, he's in the coin as well. The Kavasaka Bikoyin, the Yosef Akaspat, the guy is sitting by the cash register. Again, that should confirm that he's a partner. Ah, my Tarek Lirsham, forget about tagging. The answer is Amri Himuni Hamni. People will say, the coin sitting at the cash register is just looking after the, uh, the, the cash. Because he's trusted by the Yid. It doesn't indicate partnership. And that's why you need to tag it. Well, by the guy as well. Maybe he's still, he's still keeping an eye on the cash. Perhaps by the guy as well. Just trust him to look. No. You don't trust the guy. The fact that he's sitting at the cash register indicates that he's a partner. You probably say another answer to this apparent conflict is. Stam mifapoy. Both cases are speaking where the guy is simply present somewhere in the butcher store. The guy is, in the case of the Kay, and the Kay is, what's the difference? The difference is like this. Stam Goy gets involved. He lets his uh, opinions be heard. Oh, you should sell it for more, for less. Ah. So that uh, indicates that he's a partner. And... Uh, Eliminates any need to uh, publicize that, to tag it. But by your coin, Rashi says, coin that's a discreet person. Certainly, he's not a big, uh, typically not a big uh, expert in business. So he keeps his, uh, himself, keeps in the back, he keeps it himself. In which case, it's not clear that he's a shotov. So you have to tag it to indicate that that's the reason for your ex- exemption. Oh, my mind. Now, in the last case, we had Upsule Magdashim and Tzarech Lirushim. If you're shechting Upsule Magdashim, which is a reason for exemption, you don't have to be Rishim, you don't have to tag it. Alma Muchemos, apparently. The very fact that you're selling it in private, you don't sell it out in the butcher store, out in the market, in a disrespectful manner for the carbon, right? Even a form of carbon has to be treated with respect. So, the fact that you're selling it privately in a non-commercial setting is Mucha Musa indicates what it is and makes it evident why it's exempt. Really? You don't sell it out in the market? But well, not now we have a Mishnah which says that you could. Psula Magdashim, Squalified Karbanis, and Karm Beitlis. They're meant to be sold out in the market. And Shechatim Beitlis and Shechatim out there. And Shechatim Beitlis, you weigh it on the, on the scale like anything else. Rashi explains, the reason is because these had to be redeemed, right? So if the uh, purchaser knows that he can get a good return for it, he can sell it out in the market and get uh, properly uh, proper customers, he's more willing to invest in the animal and to offer a higher rate of redemption. So that's why it's allowed. You're allowed to go sell it in the market because ultimately it's for the benefit of Hegdish to receive a higher return, a higher offer for the uh, Pidyoin, which will be forwarded to the purchase of new current. So bottom line is you are selling it out in the market like anything else. So where's the evidence that it, it's Absolut Magdash? And why would anybody realize what it is? And when you exempt yourself from giving matanis, they'll suspect you of stealing. Tirgamar of Adabar Ava, he explained Kameda Rapapa, Boisan and Koram Techabais. We're not speaking about an ordinary Sulayam Dashim which are sold in the market, rather, we're speaking about those that are sold at home only, Rashi explains. There's an exception to that rule, which is Bukhir and Masr. Bukhir and Masr Bahima, 
don't really belong to the car to the hegdish. Bechor is a car which belongs to the kayan, and Master Behem belongs to the Bailam. So, if anything goes wrong there, and you have to be paid there, who ultimately benefits the owners? So you have no right to degrade the carbon for your own personal benefits. You can't sell it out in the market, even though that's going to diminish its rate of return. Because here, the higher rate of redemption only benefits the owners. So you have no right to do that at the expense of uh, dishonoring the, uh, the, the behemoth, the, the, you know, the carbon. So in this case, says the Brisa, it's plain to all, plain for all to see. And this is a unique animal, and that's why it's exempt from matons. Speaking about partnerships, so to what extent does he have to be a partner to exempt the animal from matones? And if he's a partner in just one part, does that exempt the entire animal? Amrav Huna should have Barosh. If the Kohen is a partner in the head, where the Lechi is situated, Patimana Lechi. So he's exempt from giving the Lechi to a Kohen. But the other uh, elements of the Matana, Zroya and Keva, he still has to give. So each item is dealt with separately. Should have Bayad. If the Kohen is a partner in the arm, Patimana Zroya. So he's exempt from that Matana. But he has to give the rest. Shut of Venemi Ai. The Shut of the innards, Patamina Keva. The Chiba Rabamar says, no, it's all or nothing. Afilu Shut of Bahas, man, even if he's only a partner on one element, Patam Mikulon. It's one package. If you're exempt on one, you're exempt on everything. Mace comes a cash from a Brisa, which indicates otherwise, that they're dealt with separately. Haroi shall leave a Kula Shalcha. The coin says, look, I'm selling you the animal, but I'm holding on to the head. Head remains mine, the coins. Even if it's just a hundredth of that head, potter, so he's exempt. The animal's exempt. Another example, I'm keeping the hand, the rest is yours. Once again, even if he only owns a hundredth, one part out of a hundred of that hand, potter, it's exempt. Third case, the uh, insides are mine, everything else is yours. I feel like it's only one in a hundred. Potter, it's exempt. Now, when we say exempt, what does that mean? He's exempt from the obligation pertaining to that particular limb or the entire package. My love, let's assume Potter min alechi. He's exempt from giving the lechi because it's partially owned by the kayan. But he must give the other two elements, v'chai bekulon. Likewise, Potter min Azroya, Vachai Bekulon. In the case of the Zroya, he's exempted from that, but he has to give the rest. In the third case, it's Potter min Akeva, that's off. But Vachai, he has to give the other ones Bekulon. No, no, Potter min Kulon. It certainly means that he's exempt from the entire package. Because if there's any element of partnership, it exempts everything. Well, if that's the case for listening, Potter min Kulon, the prices should specify. That's something you have to clarify. That is Potter from everything. Why didn't the bride say it like that? But wait, tiny. Furthermore, there's a bride which clearly says that it's only a partial exemption. The client says, Aroy shall live with I'm keeping the head, the rest is yours. I feel like I'm even if he only owns one part of a hundred Baroish in the head, Potter, that exempts him from what? Only from the Lechi, which is inside the Roish. But he has to give the rest, the Chai Bekulun, and that's a straight out to Yufta refutation on the Shita of the Chia Barav to Yufta. Amr of Chizda. Where was Chibarav coming from? Why did he have this uh, premise that it's all connected, it's all one bundle? And even a partial exemption exempts the entire thing. Hamas Nisa Tisei. He was misled by the apparent message in the following Brisa that misled him. L'chibarav. The sign you have a Brisa. A full comprehensive list of all the matanis kuhuna, 24 in total. We all know about 24, but what are they? Here comes the bride, the sun, the esrim barb matanis kuhuna, there are 24 gifts given to Kayhanim to support them, to support their learning, right? Vichula nitnulan levanov, they all gifted to Aaron and his children, bachlalo prat. The Pasuk begins with a general, you know, reference to the matanis and then specifies them, that's klalo prat. Very similar to the klalo prat formula that's learned throughout Shas. And secondly, Ubris Melach. They enwrapped in the covenant of salt, which never spoils. And the message is called Makaiman. If one adheres to these things, he uh, 
complies and he gives these matanas, good for him. Kilu kim klaloprat, it's like he fulfilled the entire Torah, which is laden with klaloprat, the formulas, ubris melach, and the bris melach that's linked to karbonais. Karbonais are based on bris melach, the uh, eternal covenant between us and Hashem. And on the flip side, a person disregards these matanis, kilu evra kalaprat, ubris melach, it's like he uh, transgresses all those wonderful things. Okay, what are these 24? Beilohe, divided into three categories. Eser, ten of them are in Migdash, are specific to the base of Migdash, meant to be consumed based on Migdash. Arba Yishalayim, four are consumed in Yishalayim, by Eser Begvul, and ten throughout the, you know, the cities of Eretz Yisrael. What are the ten Eser Begvul? That's all the Karbanis. Chatas, Vachatas, Oif, Vashem, Vadai, Vashem, Tali, Vizr, Vashem, Vizr, Public Shlomims, Vizr, Vashem, Vashem, Vizr, 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 Pesach, for a total of ten. Next, the four of Yishalayim, the four of Yishalayim have Bechir, that's the first one, Bechir, which uh, the Kohen can eat throughout the city, Vabikurim, which the Kohen can eat throughout Yishalayim, Umuram mina toida v'me'el nozer, the part that's sectioned off from the toida and the El nozer given to a Kohen. Now, in reality, these are two separate karbonates, but they're bundled together because they're very similar. So they're listed as one item, and number four are Va'irais Kadashim, the hides of the karbonates given to the Kohen. Third category, Ve'eser Begvum, ten throughout the cities, which is Truma, right? Truma Gedoyla, Truma Smaser, the Levi gives to the coin, V'chala from the Dobre. So I guess the first sharing is Matanais, Umatanais, oh, sounds familiar, right? That's the Israel Chaim Akeva, which incidentally are bundled together as one item on the list, even though they're really three separate sections. That's going to be important for us soon. Upidin Aben, the five coins in exchange for the Bechar, Upidin Beta Hamar. Right, the animal that's given in exchange for the firstborn donkey was the achuza. A person donates a, an estate, and ultimately it's not redeemed. It goes back to the goes to the kaihanim. Stay charamim. A person does a commitment called cherem. He donates his field as a cherem. It goes to the kaihanim. He gets lager. He falsely uh, swears against the ger that he didn't, you know, steal from him, and then he admits he has to give the money. Uh, you know, if the kohen, if the ger, if the ger really passed on, the money is forwarded to Kayhanim. End of the list of 24. Now, who suffer? Chir Barav uh, understood the fact that the Bryce lumps together all three matones as one item on the list. Chadanino, apparently they're one, inseparable entity. And therefore, if one is exempt from one, it's a total and comprehensive exemption. Inseparable. Veloy says the more incorrect. Because Atu, look, do you think Muram mitoide vel nazar those two items, part that is sectioned off the Itoida and El Nazar, the Kachashul Kachad, despite being counted as one, which from the Chad and they're really one, two separate karbanas, unrelated. Ella, rather, since they're close enough, so they're lumped together as one item on the list. Doesn't mean they're really inseparable. Ella, keeping the Dhamma, since they're similar to each other, they're parts of the Kachim Kalim, give to the Kachim. Therefore, Kachashul Kachad, we count them as one. Achanami, here's well regarding the Matonis. Technically, they're three separate things, but since they're similar, they're packaged as one item on the list. Achanami, here's well, keeping the Dami Adadi, since they're very similar to each other. Kachashul Kachad, we count them as one, but technically they're three, and even if the partnership on one exempts that one, the other two elements are still obligated. Ibayla, now comes a new question. Haroish Lachav Kulashali. What about the reverse type of arrangement? The Kayin says to the straw, look, by the head, the rest of the animal remains mine. <laughs> so within the head we have the Chayayim. So the obligatory section is in the hands of the straw, perhaps, that obligates him. Or, no, since the primary animal is sitting by the Kayin, Ma, what's the Allah? Basar Chayyubaz Linan. We focus on the obligated element the section of the animal which is the matana which is now the chiyuva is where it's got to be strong it's by the straw so it's chayv or dilma or pranas basar ikar behimazlina we focus on the main part of the animal which is by the kayan that exempts the entire animal the ikar behimazlina the kayinu tashmai comes at right says the bride so oivit kechavim the kayan a guy or the havdala kayan she must return him with straw it's their own animal and they uh, hired a year to share the wool Potter. There's no obligation to give uh, the first shearing to a coin because uh, the shearing is owned by a coin or by a coin. However, likewise, the person buys the shearings of a coin. So basically, it's the guy's animal, and the Jew purchased the rights to share the wool. Potter, 
that too exempts him from giving Rashi Sakis. Because after all, the animal belongs to the guy, despite the fact that the shearings belong to the Israel. But this is unique to Rashi Sakis. Because in a similar circumstance, if it would involve, if it would entail Zroyel Chayam Vekeva, he would be Chayv. Meaning if the entire animal belongs to the Kain, but the specific sections within belongs to the Israel, the sections that contain the obligatory elements of Zroyel, etc., he would be Chayv to give it. And here we find an advantage, one up. Which supersedes Yoyit Merisa Gaze. There's a Pshat Achrenu explained. What's the difference? I mean, really, what's the difference between the two? I mean, either you look at the uh, animal, you don't. You see, by Rashi Sagaze, the first shearings really are a sampling of the whole thing. You have a mix of shearings, and part of it you take off and you give to the. So if the whole animal which is producing this the whole supply is really a, belonging to a guy or a co- the chiv never starts, it never takes off. As opposed to zroya and l'chayayim, etc. It's not a chiv on the whole animal. Those specific limbs, that section, that element, belongs to the kain. So if that is owned by Yisrael, he has to give it. Notwithstanding the fact that the rest of the animal belongs to a kain, who cares? What you own is obligated. So that's the conclusion, Shema Minah. That allows us to confirm that, in fact, Basar Chiv Azlinan. We focus on the uh, actual obligatory elements. And who owns them? Shema Minah. That's a proper confirmation. Okay, so conclusion. We discussed being careful about the L'chayayim and the blood veins there, the, uh, the, the Chutin. We discussed uh, a question of grabbing and, and, and taking and Turns out that Vinasan tells you you meant to give it to the coin in a respectful, honorable way. He's not meant to grab or ask or take. We have the uh, Chiddush that uh, Rav Yosef tells us that a Kayin can actually help out a Talmud Chacham by sort of diverting, forwarding the Matanis to him in his time of need. We have the story of Rava who followed it uh, in his case and Rav Safra refrained. We have the Cholim which uh, sort of sided with Rav Safra spoke about the importance of being selective uh, with respect to teaching Torah to a proper Talmidim. Proceeded to the idea of a shutfas with a guy or a kain, which exempts, but uh, he meant to ensure that it's uh, public knowledge, lest uh, people draw the conc- raw conclusions regarding, uh, you know, uh, you haven't taken away the matanis from the kain, so you have to make sure that it's uh, evident and known why you are keeping it. We discussed the extent of the exemption by a shutfus. Turns out that the uh, shutfus only exempts that particular part of the shutfus, but the rest, which is Israel owned as Chai, we had a list of 24 Matanis Kahuna. Uh, and interesting shayla at the end, with a distinction between Risa Gez and Matanis with respect to a uh, behemoth which is owned primarily by a uh, Kayin and only partially by Israel. When it comes to Risa Gez, completely Potter. But when it comes to Matana, it's, it's all about who owns that particular part of the animal. Okay, thank you so much for joining. All the best to you and always Hatzlacha.